Okay, I think we can start with the final panel for this uh, for today's conference. First of all, thank you for remaining with us for the third panel of uh, of the day. Um, I just uh, on a technical point of view, I just remember that uh, there will be um, a contribution in Italian uh, during this panel as well. So for those who are not speaking in Italian, there are some headphones with simultaneous translations. So uh, you may check that uh, at the end. Thank you. I also want to apologize before starting and introducing this, uh, this last panel for the technical issues that we had. Unfortunately, we were not able to connect with our speakers uh, remotely that uh, would join us uh, remotely. Um, so we will have uh, some kind of other contribu contribution from them that we will try to communicate with yes. our tunnels afterwards. I'm very sorry for that. Um, so this morning we have uh, two very interesting panels dedicated uh, to uh, two uh, very concerning issues when it comes to freedom of speech. So the one again, the one uh, regarding slaps and the one uh, regarding the ANFA, the European Media Freedom Act. We will, we will close this, uh, this conference with a panel dedicated to the security of, uh, of journalists. Because as we have, uh, have seen in our discussions, as we know, we know that journalists are uh, somehow a watchdog of power. They are um, they play a crucial role in uh, holding the democratic values, including media freedom. But of course, they need an amazing environment. They need a safe environment to work in. So uh, this is the final panel, this final panel the security of, um, of journalists. Uh, we know that, uh, unfortunately, um, journalists all around the world every day face uh, harassment, intimidation, and uh, attacks. And uh, uh, Europe, especially as, um, for long, has been uh, thought of being a secure place for, for journalists. And especially countries from the European Union have been considered one of the safest places for journalists to work in. Uh, however, in reality, what we experience in, in reality is that journalists also in the European countries um, face the threat, the attacks, and intimidation on a daily basis. Just to mention some, uh, some data, um, within the Media Freedom Rapid Response, we have this platform mapping media freedom. And just in the, in the, at the beginning, in the first nine months of 2023, there have been more than 400 attacks and intimidation registered against journalists in the European space. When I talk about the European space, I mean the European Union and candidate countries. But among these 400, 200 attacks were registered in European in countries from the European Union. So this really, this data really makes me question whether Europe is actually a really safe place for for journalists to work in, or if we should start should should start start talking and reflecting on it as well. Uh, of course, when we talk about the security and safety of journalists, we talk about an all-embracing uh, concept that, that ranges from uh, intimidation, physical and psychological violence, legal arrest, uh, arbitrary detention, and so on. So security of journalists is really an all-embracing uh, concept. Uh, since 2020, the European Union has been issuing its uh, rule of law report. In its uh, rule of law report, the European Commission has witnessed an increased number of attacks and harassment cases against journalists in the European space. And, they, and precisely based on this rule of law reports, in 2021, the European Commission adopted the recommendation on the security of journalists. The aim of this recommendation is to uh, promote a joint and coordinated um, efforts and um, effort by the member states to improve the, the security and the situation concerning the security of journalists in the European in the European space. Well, in its recommendation, the Commission touches upon a different aspect connected with the security and safety of journalists. And one of these aspects is the role of law enforcement authorities, the law, the role of state authorities in ensuring that journalists can actually work in a safe and living environment. Um, so this is precisely the topic and the focus of our panel today. We will talk about the safety of journalists focusing on the role of the state, on the role of law enforcement authorities. And we will hear the stories from four different countries, three different countries actually, because I said at the beginning, I'm sorry, but 
Dariana Dino, who was supposed to be with us, but unfortunately won't be able to join us. She would have presented the table from Albania. But we have, um, anyway, very interesting, we will have a very interesting insights from uh, Italy, from uh, Romania, and from Montenegro as well. So we will have somehow a comparison be between and among the different situations in, in the country. And uh, um, so we will see and we will hear the stories and experiences of journalists and researchers that have, have had to deal with the security and safety issues. So I leave it here for now and give the floor straight away to my colleague, Kushen, uh, who's going to present his panel and moderate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't know if my microphone is on. It is good. Um, thank you very much. So my name is Kishi Sommer. I am the Policy and Policy Officer at Free Press Unlimited based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and I focus specifically on the safety of journalists. Before we start, I was wondering if we could perhaps put that more on the phone before I can use them. Thank you. Um, just for the noise. So um, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending um, this panel, this last panel of the day. I think uh, Serena already uh, perfectly explained the 2021 uh, EC recommendation on the protection, safety, and empowerment of journalists, which calls on member states to ensure a safe, uh, safe working conditions for journalists and media workers. But yes, as mentioned, uh, there are still a lot of threats and attacks against journalists, and they remain an issue in many of the EU countries as well as Canada countries. Um, so in today's panel, uh, we will take stock of the safety of journalists in three different European countries, uh, both member states and Canada's countries, and we will hear first-hand experiences from very high-profile journalists and media professionals. Mm -hmm. um, we will explore the relationship, as was said as well, between journalists and law enforcement authorities, because even though law enforcement um, authority must protect journalists, they may also pose some threats to the press freedom. So first, I want to introduce our panelists. Um, on the left, we have Emilia Serta, a Romanian investigative journalist, author and senior lecturer at the Faculty of Journalism and Communication Science within the University of Bucharest. Um, then we have Paolo Bogometti, a well-known crime journalist, FNSI, uh, National Councillor from Italy, uh, and AGI, AGI sorry, co-director and president at Article 21, Articolo 21. Yes. 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 <laughs> and then uh, on my left, I have Serdan Kosovic, uh, the current digital director at VSD. Uh, until 15 days ago, he was the editor in chief. Um, and VSC is the biggest uh, independent media group in Montenegro with a long record of trust workings. So, that being said, uh, let us first move to the uh, third panelist uh, on my left, which is uh, with Emilia Sertan. Um, Emilia has faced a lot of personal harassment uh, following revelations that she did uh, in her journalistic work. So we are very thankful that you are here to share your story and perhaps actually what I forgot to mention on a broader note is we are very thankful that you are all here to share your story because I think in essence you shouldn't be here talking about safety threats that you are facing you should spend this time on your journalistic work so therefore thank you very much for being here um, Emilia please uh, take the floor um, hello everyone and thank you so much for, for having me here and uh, also I want to thank uh, so much to all the, all the people in, in, this, uh, in this room that helped me in recent years when I faced a lot of threats uh, and uh, smear campaigns and uh, um, other, other uh, professional situations that put my, my profession in danger. I uh, first want to start with a confession. Usually in the last years, I used to publish around 24, 26 pieces in a year. Last year, I published just six pieces, six, six articles. Um, just two of them were not related with my case. So I published six pieces, but four of them were related with my case. I exposed things that are related with my case. 
And uh, starting with this, I, I will uh, move to, um, to uh, present you my case um, with some insights. And I really hope that you will ask me questions about uh, what uh, you think that uh, can uh, explain better uh, besides I will present you. Uh, you all know that uh, investigative journalism could be very dangerous uh, when it implies uh, revealings about uh, wars, about organized crime, about mafia, um, human trafficking, arms trafficking, drugs trafficking. But um, I will speak you how dangerous it would be when a journalist goes to the library. In the last uh, eight years, I, uh, I uh, specialized myself in uh, revealing uh, plagiarism in doctoral dissertations, books, and other uh, scientific papers of uh, uh, Romanian politicians. Um, I'm a journalist with uh, over 25 years of experience. And uh, in the past, I used to cover politics and uh, economic corruption. Um, of course, uh, on on high level in in our in our uh, society, uh, and uh, um, uh, covering uh, plagiarism is a is a new uh, subject for me. Um, during the economic crisis fifteen years ago, I I uh, orientated myself to the academia. I um, I defended myself a PhD um, in communication science, and I became a lecturer at the University of Bucharest uh, journalism department. Uh, but uh, when I uh, when I understand uh, how much work implied to um, to work for my for my uh, uh, doctoral dissertation, I understood how much imposture and how much pleasure we have in uh, in Romania because it was a fashion it was very fashionable for our politicians to um to um uh, to look after obtaining a, a doctoral dissertation a doctoral uh, uh title and uh, so um so i started in 2015 um uh, wrote about the uh, prime interim prime minister at that moment in romania and uh I would never imagine in that moment that uh, I I would uh, turn uh, this uh, that that very uh, very specific subject in in a I don't know in a uh, kind of public mission. Uh, that uh, former interim prime minister also was a professor and a PhD um, uh, supervisor. He, he uh, supervised 22 people in, um, in, in academia. They also granted the doctoral titles. But uh, uh, all of them were very powerful people, like, uh, like uh, uh, people that were uh, chiefs or uh, former chiefs of uh, Romanian intelligence services, uh, generals in, in the police or in the army, uh, top politicians, uh, uh, prosecutors, judges, and so on. Well, uh, starting with that moment, I, um, I I covered this subject, this very niche uh, subject, and I wrote about prime ministers, vice prime ministers, ministers of uh, internal affairs, defense, health, education. Yes, we had a minister of education that plagiarized his document dissertation. I wrote about uh, uh, prosecutors, about uh, uh, intelligence generals, police generals, army generals, judges, and uh, um, other kind of uh, uh, politicians. In 2019, I, I was uh, I was uh, uh, threatened with death after I wrote that the uh, rector of police academy plagiarized his doctoral dissertation. And uh, also, I, uh, I, I wrote in that moment that inside of Police Academy, it was uh, constructed uh, a real plagiarism network. Uh, just imagine the institution that is uh, that has to train the future uh, police officers was, uh, was an institution where corruption, moral corruption, was very profound and deeply 
um, um, I don't know, infiltrated, let's say. Um, the ones that threatened me were the rector and the vice rector of the police academy, so the heads of this institution. The rector was also a general police, uh, 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 yes, and also a professor in academia. And the prorector was uh, a chief commissioner and uh, associate professor. Both of them were uh, were uh, 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 were prosecuted, uh, were investigated, prosecuted, and sentenced uh, last year for three years suspended imprisonment. At least in this case, we had a solution, and the ones that were uh, guilty, uh, they uh, they received a, a, a decision from our uh, from our justice. But uh, last year in January, I wrote that the prime minister in office in that moment, General uh, former Army General uh, Nikolai Chukar, he was also the head of the Romanian Army. Uh, plagiarized his doctoral dissertation, and uh, uh, this uh, this uh, revealing uh, came with a new threat. Um, and uh, uh, after this, uh, after this threat came also a compromise operation organized inside of the Romanian police against me. I know that. I wrote a lot about the Romanian police, but I never imagined that someone inside the police will organize something like this. So, uh, secondly, after I published that uh, a doctoral dissertation of, uh, of uh, the prime minister was plagiarized, I received a threat on, on the email. Um, and uh, I will resume just a very small piece of the threat, just to understand how serious it was. If it is not true that General Chuka has plagiarized his doctoral thesis and it is proven, we will send you ghosts to your uh, we will send ghosts to your to your work, to your house, everywhere will everywhere you will move, and uh, you will feel their presence everywhere, including in your privacy. Pray to God you right. Uh the, the message is. Uh, much longer, but I just uh, summarize a, a bit uh, of, of it. Uh, sounds bad, isn't it? Um, but uh, this threat was, was nothing compared with what uh, came after this. Uh, one month after I, I received the, uh, this threat, I also received a message on Facebook from uh, a stranger. This stranger sent me five personal pictures uh, that were made five years, uh, 20 years ago, sorry. The, the, the pictures were made 20 years ago by my fiance. Uh, and one of these uh, personal pictures, um, don't imagine like four pictures or something like this. They were just personal intimate, let's say, pictures. Um, one of them was a screenshot and uh, it has that screenshot has had also a name of a site on it. I put the name of that site in Google and my name, and I discovered that um, uh, that five pictures were uploaded on thirty-one porn sites, and um, it was a double shock. Basically, when I discovered that someone stole my pictures and also uploaded that pictures on on uh, on the uh, on on thirty one porn sites, well, the second day I um, filled a complaint to the police and I gave to the police to the case police uh, officer as a proof. Uh, the message I received from uh, a screenshot of uh, a screenshot of the message I received from that person. Uh, well, 40 minutes after I left the, the police, uh, that screenshot, I never shared the screenshot with someone else. So I, I had the screenshot only on my phone. That screenshot together with my, my five pictures were published on a site. 
um, from Republic of Moldova uh, that, that was owned by a former um, a member, Romanian member of parliament who was convicted for four years and uh, eight months in prison for corruption and who was uh, who, who fled uh, from conviction in the Republic of Moldova. Um, later, that article was uh, uh, was uh, um, um, was distributed by uh, by about eighty other sites from Romania in a very clear and evident uh, uh, smear campaign, but also uh, uh, I would say an assassination, a moral assassination campaign. Um, well, I understood from the first moment that uh, the screenshot that became a piece of evidence in uh, in uh, in the police uh, criminal file was leaked from from the police, and uh, that was even a bigger shock for me than the ones I I I had a day before when when I discovered that someone steal my pictures in an unknown. Uh, circumstances and uploaded them on, on that uh, site for for uh, porn sites. Well, um, after I discovered this, I I I I, I discovered that that piece of evidence had has been leaked from from the Romanian police. I I felt an, another a new criminal complaint, and but. Uh, of course, uh, 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 against uh, against the ones that leaked the, the screenshot, but uh, uh, some uh, months after, I, I discovered I discovered I, I uh, helped by uh, people from um, from uh, uh, Curium Foundation from Sweden and also Big Defender Company, that is a security protection company. Um, um, from Romania, they uh, they helped me to find out that uh, basically the Romanian police organized a new a new operation. This time to uh, to uh, hide their traces, basically to um, to cover up the leaking from the police, and they upload the pictures on another site. Uh, basically, the, the 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 article that was published in Republic of Moldova was published on another site, but they backdated it, and uh, it, they made it to look like the article was published published with five hours before. I went to the police to uh, uh, to 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 fill that con to make that complaint and. Um, well, so um, in that day also, I was, uh, I don't know how to say, just imagine how, how much was the shock for me. And uh, the, the chief of the Romanian police and even the uh, minister of internal affairs tried to convince me and they convinced me not to go to the prosecutor, but to, to make another criminal complaint to the police office, but they um, they basically doing this. They they uh, did everything to block the future investigation in order to discover who was guilty and who who was the one that leaked the uh, uh, the evidence, the piece of evidence inside the the police. Um, since then. There are one year and eight months, and I made uh, a lot of criminal complaints against just in order to, uh, I don't know, to find some justice in this case. And there are seven uh, criminal files opened, uh, but um, in all these seven criminal files, no one was uh, put under accusation, and the prosecutor doesn't have any any suspects. So no one is uh, basically until now uh, guilty for uh, what happened uh, uh, one year and eight months ago. And I, to be very honest, I don't have any hopes that the Romanian authorities, the law enforcement, will uh, make a proper investigation and finally someone will be. 
uh, convicted for this. Um, in um, well, in in the file where I received that uh, message, uh, I summarized that piece of message earlier. So in that file. Uh, last week, I, I received um, a letter from uh, the prosecutor, and the prosecutor told me, announced me that basically they dropped the the uh, prosecution because there are there is no public interest in following the crime. So there is any public interest to go for, for forward to to try to. Um, uh, see who, who was guilty. Um, also, one of the other seven files is uh, closed. And uh, in, the, in the main case, in the main file where the pro prosecutors are investigating, are investigating the leaking of information, the leaking of evidence, that piece of evidence from the police, um, Basically, the prosecutor are not investigating the main uh, accusation, the main crime, disclosure of um, uh, secret uh, uh, information of a, or or or, or uh, uh, an information that is not uh, for public. And um, I have to tell you one more thing. Um, since uh, July this year. The pictures, my pictures were still online. Even I made four uh, special requests to the prosecutor to remove because in Romania, according to the law, the prosecutor is obliged to, um, to uh, I don't know how to say, to uh, remove all the, uh, all the consequences of, an, of, an, uh, of a crime, yes. And basically, they were obliged. I asked them four times to remove the pictures, but, but they didn't. Uh, the, the pictures were removed in July, not in July, sorry, in August. Uh, after uh, the prosecutor, in, in one case, asked the, the owner of the site, who is the administrator of the site, of the website. And uh, in the day when uh, the owner of uh, this uh, website uh, sent the in, sent the, the response to the uh, prosecutor, uh, also the site was closed. So now the site is not working anymore. Um, I don't want to talk today about my sleep last night, about my struggle, about my suffering, my revolt against the corrupt. Uh, and uh, the corrupt uh, uh, um, and politically controlled uh, judiciary system in Romania. Uh, my speech today, I want to be a wake up call about the journalists who are victims of smear campaigns, some of them organized by state authorities or by politicians, uh, and who cannot defend themselves because the, because the states is protecting those who have attacked them and because the legal action is too expensive. And believe me, some of my colleagues that maybe are, um, um, are subject of some smear campaigns in Romania, they, they can't afford to go um, uh, to the police and to start a battle for their privacy, for their professional life, for even for their lives, just because it's too expensive and they don't have enough money. Um, and I want to, to tell you that as much as we need uh, a mechanism against slaps and a mechanism for financing uh, slaps against journalists, as much I think we need a mechanism support to, to uh, a mechanism to support the journalists to support them when their profession and their professional lives. Uh, are threatened by this kind of campaigns. And um, I think, I don't know, maybe we journalists need to learn to, to defend ourselves when we are subject and not to drop or, or not to be, I don't know, um, uh, broken, let's say, in front of this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, threat against us.
And thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mia, for sharing your personal story, which I've heard before. I mean, she was spoken to me all the time. And often, but every time it's when you tell the story, it's, it's really shocking. And thank you very much for sharing because it's a very personal story. No, it's it's very important for me to, to speak publicly mm -hmm. and it's very important to have uh, an international audience because you know it's so complicated in my in my country to find justice mm -hmm. and basically to to fight against one of the most powerful people in the country and I don't know if I, I told you earlier I'm a famous journalist I don't have an organization in my back. I'm alone. And I have to invest. I invested all my life in the last two years, or one year and eight months, in trying to uh, find justice and trying to make the uh, judiciary system to treat us, the journalists, not as a special person, but just to to make um, not to not to smash us because I, I, I feel that I, I am smashed. You can imagine my, my right to my my constitutional right to live to legal to legal defend was denied in one of these cases. The main suspect was was heard by the prosecutor without my, my lawyer to be present there. It's so complicated to just when when I when I discovered this when I went to the I don't want to make this so personal but when I went to the prosecutor to see the file and I discovered that they heard the 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 personal uh, uh, suspect the former deputy member of the parliament and I discovered I, I just felt that I am collapsing. I went outside the, the, that building and I, I was obliged to call 911 because I felt sick in the home. It was so outrageous to see that my right to have be defended by my lawyer when, when the main suspect was, was uh, defended was basically denied. My, my, my lawyer was not announced, was not notified before this. So I'm sorry, but I'm brave enough to 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 um, continue and to keep walking with this battle. Please. Um, no apologies needed at all. Of course, I think, as you say, this is a sign of being very brave and this is your personal story but as you say it's also a broader issue in Romania and that's why it's really important I think that you share this story. Um, as you said you or as it became clear you really tried everything or are trying everything to achieve justice for these cases but you also you also mentioned that we're starting to lose hope a bit. Um, I don't know if you want to answer another question or if you can if, maybe if you want can. a break. No, yes, <laughs> maybe after this. Thank you. Of course, thank you. Um I think we will now move to Sarah sitting next to me. Um as mentioned, uh, Sarah works in Montenegro uh, for US that's my pronunciation. Um, Sarah, your the outlet that you work for has also experienced different forms of threats and intimidation in the past years, but there have also been some changes. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about um, the, the safety issue that you are experiencing? Well, I, I would like to, if, if it's not uh, much of a hassle, just the first to express great admiration for what we really think. And also to share something I wanted to share after the, the, the panel. Actually, I mean, I think it would be relevant. Your, your work is actually greatly appreciated in Romania because when I posted on my social media that I'm going to be speaking on this panel, literally all of my friends, there is like seven or eight of them from Romania, 
literally every one of them sent me the, the message saying, oh, well, you're there with Emilia on the panel, that's going to be great, you're following on, 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 on her work. And I really wasn't familiar with, 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 with your professional work, but now I will be following up on it more closely. Yeah. And uh, I'll use the, the, the subject as well of the, on, on a bit of a bright note, since you obliterated, obviously, the <laughs> academia, false academia, Romania, I wish we could offer uh, to send Montenegrin uh, scholars <laughs> to replace them, but it's not my better situation in Montenegro as well. Uh, concerning those cases, I myself have uh, been investigating uh, on some levels of like quotation cartels in uh, in Montenegro and uh, the very suspicious way that they've been attaining both scientific and academic degrees, so both from PhDs and masters to the uh, to the titles like the professors and, and so on. And uh, what I have noticed uh, in, in, in Emilia's case and in Montenegro's case as well, uh, something that is uh, very much relevant when we are talking about uh, security of media, at least in Montenegro, it's a huge lack of media solidarity. I think that's something that uh, Krik, which Yelena was talking about, is experiencing very gravely. gravely. Uh, for example, I think 10 days ago, just using it as an example because it's fresh and I can elaborate on it detailly, not because it's just important because it's my article. I wrote an article about this academic degrees from a faculty in Montenegro. And you would expect from academia that you would you know, get a decent response, like try to establish a dialogue. On it, what actually happened is that after so only one article was published on this website, uh, no other media in Montenegro on a larger scale republished the article. But the entire, the full group of other media from Montenegro published over 30 singular reactions to the article without publishing previously a single word. From the original article that I that I published, and even if there were relevant arguments in those replies, and obviously just to state very important thing, only one of those articles was sent to ESC for us to publish. It didn't um, it didn't comply with the, with the with the media law because the media law of the says that you know you have the right to correct all the wrong facts or all the I mean. All those things that were not facts or misinterpretation of the article, but uh, the reaction that you got are like, you know, just a part of a sphere campaign. You know, you're a foreign agent, you're doing this because of this and that and that and that. So, you know, there were no there were no conditions for us to publish the tender reply, but they didn't stop the entire group of media in Montenegro to publish that one and another 30 more that went from a really wide range, you know, from those. That were trying to personally uh, discredit me on many cases. <laughs> I mean, going up to the level that you know, they found a person that committed the crime hundreds of years ago, I'm not even kidding, that has the same last name as me, which is not really unusual in Montenegro, but not really super often, but not super rare either. And they said, well, this must be your uh, grand grandfather or something. And that it's published, it was not on social media because. We are not in VSD, at least we are not sensitive at all on what's published on social media because we've been receiving so much more serious stuff that we now actually don't care about messages that we receive on Facebook. And no, it was published on one of the, one of the, well, I would say, fifth or sixth media per ranking visits in Montenegro, you know, that kind of an article that elaborates that relation between. Me and the person that committed the crime kind of years ago, that bears the same last name. So that's kind of a how the media solidarity uh, is is really lacking. I think it's it's really crucial for establishing uh, the pressure that media requires to put on the on the authorities for them to do their their work. If you have that kind of a approach where you try to present everything as I don't know a personal 
feud between one media and all other groups. And, you know, I mean, again, <laughs> I'm going back to Creek because we are republishing so many Creek articles on VST website. And then I see it, uh, I see it because, you know, the Serbian media scene is very similar, unfortunately, uh, to Montenegro. Well, I would say even far worse than Montenegro right now. Uh, also, the question of the media solidarity, just uh, more to, to explain on what Lucy said there about uh, things that change. Well, at least now, wow, three years after we had experienced the first democratic change in power in Montenegro, uh, at least now it's not happening that you know the public broadcaster is publishing uh, also that kind of a type of uh, an article, which is a reaction to something that they didn't even publish a single word, single word on. And, the methodology they would do. So you know, we take public broadcaster in Montenegro because it's funded by by taxpayers. Also, it's part of like it's not more important, but it's also part of the state uh, structure. So they would do you know they would find people to 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 explain that it's attack on the state itself. That it's you know being funded by abroad and so on. And they would do it. You know, they would have a person talk about it, and then when they put those really serious accusations. They would display your photo and then just zoom it in and out, you know, just to pinpoint and who's the culprit, culprit there. So that's very, um, it's very difficult to, to I mean, for me personally, it isn't, uh, but for, for your family, it's very difficult to, to see you on the, on the top news of the public broadcaster, your face being zoomed in for like 10 times during the, uh, five minute uh, uh, video article, which is way longer than, than a standard one on the, on the public broadcast. So, to stop on the, the, the media part, let's talk about the law enforcement and the, the more specific. So, well, the thing about Montenegro, so VSP, where I have been working for my whole professional career, 13 years now. Um, and as Lucy said, I was the editor in chief for five years until 15 days ago, and I moved to, to, to a new position. Um, the thing about Montenegro that uh, organized crime was growing and developing alongside state institutions on so many levels. And uh, so, as the state institutions, you know, we had, as you are aware, very, very turbulent. Uh, a road on becoming an independent state. So in 1907, when we were established in the city of Yugoslavia, and like that, then we had Serbia and Montenegro, and then we uh, now have independent Montenegro since 2006. But the, the constant that we had was the organized crime that was dating before we were established. So the, the, especially the smuggling of cigarettes and drugs through the port of Bar and other. Uh, points from Montenegro that you know became that was a constant that is uh, you know way uh, way longer than than BST and way longer than the Montenegro uh, independent state. I mean uh, regained independence in 2006. So the new in independence, the organized track has the bigger uh, biggest uh, continuous work, so to say. So it's very difficult when we are talking about Montenegro to say, especially until 2020, but even since, uh, and especially if you add this very important component, the scale of the of the smuggling, you know, because uh, you know, what we are seeing on the, on the official reports, you know, the scale is huge because through Montenegro, you are smuggling drugs and cigarettes that are now being distributed not only in the Balkans, but throughout the whole Europe and its uh, links with South America. So you compare the size of that operation with the size of the state of Montenegro. And, you know, obviously then you have the funds that organized crime groups are controlling and its effects and the way that they can control state institutions. When you add all that, to be on the other side, to be somebody that is going to report on those cases, it's not really a it's not really an easy situation to be in. And uh, also European Union, European Commission, more specifically, in many of those reports was saying that Montenegro is an entrapped state, meaning that 
you can actually, it's very difficult to draw the line between the state, the country, and the party. And I would add that on the other level, it's very difficult, or it was very difficult, but it's a bit easier <laughs> to draw the line between the, the former ruling party and the organized crime syndicate that was and still is associated with them. So adding those components to have any kind of big scale expectations from the law enforcement to deal with those more serious cases that you know are threatening the money flow, the threatening the smuggling routes and everything. Well, we saw what happened in Croatia with Pukanic. We saw with what happened in uh, Montenegro. We had the 2004 case where we had the current chief of that with Pilavani, it was also. Uh, they were also publishing uh, things on smuggling of cigarettes, was murdered uh, since, especially since 2000. We have seen numerous, numerous attacks on the EST, so just to name a few, former internal chief had a, an explosive device planted outside of his office window. We had, I think, two or three cars set on fire. Numerous threats received on uh, all possible channels that you can think of. And in 2018, we had our journalist that was also, you can guess it on your own, by herself, uh, until now covering the smuggling of cigarettes. Uh, she was shot and wounded in front of her apartment in 2018, in May of 2018. And that wasn't the first attack on, uh, on her personally. She was beaten up once before, she was threatened, her family was threatened. And again, I think nobody would be surprised. Total impunity on the mastermind level. So there was no single case in Montenegro where we found a culprit on the level that ordered this thing. Because I don't really, I, I mean, I, I take it personally because I was there uh, for so long and I'm still there. I really don't care who did it. I really don't care if you, you know, this guy or another guy. I want to know who ordered it because uh, thanks to fire in Montenegro, there is more of them than there is journalists to keep from, from attacking them. So I really, you know, we never really cared when they make an arrest of the person who did it because, you know, well, actually it's probably the, 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 the safest thing is to let him walk because it's the least chance that he will do it again. You know, the same person will do it again, and they have to probably hire another one. So on that level, we really didn't care. Uh, and there were cases of prosecution, but they never talked about who ordered. And you know, it's very difficult to, to think, you know, well, you know, somebody was really assaulted by us uh, reporting about uh, smuggling cigarettes. So a random type, you know, decided, well, I'm going to shoot this journalist because I don't like this kind of... Uh, uh, journalistic work, you know, we had and we had those. I mean, we had those cases in, in Montenegro, for example, and also related to journalistic uh, security. Uh, now we have a case that is ongoing about the former head of intelligence, so the agency for national security in Montenegro. Uh, he's been charged by illegal surveillance of politicians, religious figures, and journalists, and many others. In Montenegro, and he is the only one to be accused. But the specific thing about it, when you take all these things that I said before in the case, you know, how close this operation in the fall is, and the specific thing about the person itself, he was retired and they brought him back to, to be the head of security once again. So it's very unlikely that he was a lawyer or something that, you know, he was just simply curious. On his personal level, you know, what is what is this journalist doing in his on this specific day, or what is this politician doing on this specific day? You know, there was no put from the prosecutors to well, at least so far, to try to find out, you know, who gave the order to do it, because we didn't find, you know, that we didn't get to the level of where we could explain, you know, what were they using this data for and why they needed that data exactly for. And I have a lot of other marks, but we can maybe, I don't know how much time I have to already. Well, 
If you want, you have five more minutes. Oh, well, I, I, I said 15, mm -hmm. but I'll do five. I can give you five, uh, and then maybe I have a follow up. Yeah, great. Well, um, about the other forms of, of harassment and uh, pressure, we had, I think, every imaginable sort of financial harassment. Uh, you know, I can't even name them all, but the, the, the biggest confusion that we were putting in a way was, uh, well, let's do a, a little trick, like, you will get in the situation that you would need to complain, like you're talking to a, I don't know, a member of the European Parliament, and then they ask you, you know, what are the issues going on in the media and so on. And you say, you need to pay taxes. And they're like, that's like a complaint? And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's a complaint. So how is that a complaint, right? You know, they, they obviously, they, they just scratch your name <laughs> immediately. And then you explain that, well, for example, VST paid more taxes in one year than all other daily newspapers paid for three years or four years. And we are not bigger, we, are, we don't make bigger, big, huge margins, you know, profit margins or anything else. So maybe th there's obviously something at stake there, right? So yeah, obviously the others are allowed not to apply the, the, the provision. I mean, the obligatories, you know, the, I mean, they don't have to pay taxes. Good, what is it? You know, well, it's like the, the, the quote, I think it's it's attributed to some Peruvian general. And, uh, I didn't do my fact checking, I apologize for it. It's uh, forgivable for journalists, but it's there to do its purpose. Like, you know, I, and I made my misquote it as well, but they say, like, well, for my friends can do whatever they want, but for our enemies, we have the laws. And that's what basically happened in Montenegro. You know, you allow your friends, you know, your loyal media to do whatever they want, and then you apply the law on only those that you don't want to operate in a fair competition. That's all we ever asked, you know, to just be the part of the fair competition. And uh, even, you know, we, we survived on that. But I'm still a survivor. But the damage of it, the throat behind the hill is, is at first uncomprehensible because now you, you become, at one point, you cannot compete with other media, for example, or good journalists. Because if you want to hire a good journalist, you need to pay a full salary. I mean, for, for, for most of you, I need to explain. Um, what does it mean actually? You know, so if you're working for for uh, that other kind of group of media, you know, you are officially paying only the minimum salary, and you're giving rest money, the rest of the money, you know, outside of the system. So you're not paying taxes, obviously, and that that's where the difference in taxes paid appear. But when I want to hire a journalist from a, from another. Uh, media and then we are negotiating he says well i want 800 euros salary and i'm saying oh well, okay but that's that plus times 1.4 for the factor and everything so that's uh, 1400 euros for me expenses you know and you know he goes to another media and they say well, i'll give you a thousand euros because for them it's 250 minimum wage back then at 750. No, it's still way less than it. And he gets a thousand net, and we can offer him 800 net, but we pay more. We pay 14,000. So it's very difficult in that thing. And not to talk about, obviously, about how popular you want to be raised the school of journalism, because after all, the thing is, journalists that wanted to do their work properly, how did they? Uh, were treated in full, how they were paid, obviously, as well. And yeah. If I may, thank you yes. for also providing a little broader picture than just a physical 
um, saving threats. And what I wanted to get back to is you mentioned um, that there is total impunity on the mastermind level when it comes to the killing uh, of a journalist. So I think that's interesting because um, I know that there is a commission for monitoring investigations of attacks against journalists, which was established in 2013 by the government. Mm -hmm. Um, how does that relate to um, your quote? Well, it was it was established for the exact purpose. I mean, it's it's it's, uh, it's like a monitoring advisory kind of a group that does not have a mandate to do anything on its on its own, but it has been following up on the on the cases. It has been pressuring institutions to try to find uh, on the. Like, for example, for the murder of Dushko Ivanovic, they've been uh, pushing for because, um, and they are very, they did so much work, great work in, in uh, shedding some additional light on that specific case. For example, we have now, I can't say it's evidence because I didn't see it personally, it's not been uh, developed to that level, but strong hints. That, for example, the DNA from a rifle that was used to kill the Arabs, they intentionally send the wrong DNA to this button for forensic examination. And, uh, well, if the commission wasn't established for following up on that case, investigating the case, we would never know that. Mm -hmm. And now we are trying, the commission is trying to do that kind of work to try to establish at least on some level. The responsibility because you know, even the three years after the change of power, a lot of those people that are directly responsible for not having the mastermind behind uh, having any kind of responsibility are still a part of the system, especially in the judiciary and prosecutorial system. Mm -hmm. And so, you mentioned me, so does that mean that there is a close collaboration? Well, the editor, the new editor in chief, the, my predecessor, and also my predecessor. Is the part of the, the commission. So that's my personal feeling that we are B because I've been cooperating with him since, since I've been with PSC. So, no, uh, not me personally, but yeah, the journalists are part of that, yeah. of that group. Yeah, so that's why. And the only parts of the group that we have expectations are those those journalists, like the former editor in chief of that. Mm -hmm. Nicole Markovic and now the current editor of Chief Visi, Mikhail, we always just have been pushing those those things. Okay. That's why I think we thank you. Um before we move, we will later have time for questions from the audience, but first um I will ask uh, to um give the speech and I will use my earphones. Um he lives under police protection here in Italy, uh, together with um, many other journalists. So we wanted to ask you if you want to uh, give us a bit more information about the protection scheme uh, that you are under and the way this affects your personal life as well as your work as a journalist. Intanto grazie, grazie agli organizzatori, grazie. A Serena, a Nicole, e grazie ai colleghi, mi hai emozionato e ti ringrazio veramente di cuore. E permettetemi questa piccola digressione. Le cose che hai raccontato erano le stesse che io spesso sentivo da una grande collega. E che si chiama Daphne Cavana Carizia, ieri faceva sei anni eh, dalla sua uccisione e questo ci fa comprendere come eh, noi non possiamo lasciare da soli, eh, in questo caso tolgo un attimo io, eh, colleghe bravissime, straordinarie che fanno un giornalismo di inchiesta, non è vero che il giornalismo è tutto uguale, che fanno il giornalismo di inchiesta e lo fanno bene come hai fatto tu, soprattutto in paesi dove, come accadeva per Daphne, come accade per te, 
e, e, ed è un problema che questo che noi in Italia, e poi arrivo al mio, alla mia esperienza, che abbiamo meno, cioè la conduzione all'interno delle forze dell'ordine. Questo è un problema immenso che sono coloro i quali dovrebbero difendere. Mi ha particolarmente toccato il tuo racconto e non è semplice per me rispondere alla tua domanda e non è semplice per me raccontare nuovamente tutto quello che mi è accaduto in questi anni. Non è affatto semplice, prima uh, mi confrontavo con il presidente della Federazione Nazionale della Stampa, Vittorio Di Trata, che ti ringrazio, e così come se ti permettete, ti ringrazio per tutto quello che fanno Renata da tanti anni per noi giornalisti anche in Italia. Non è facile perché aprire i file dei ricordi personali eh, è veramente complicato. Io ho iniziato a, a parlare di mafia, di mafia, di criminalità organizzata, nel mio paese quando mi dicevano che la mafia non ci fosse, pensate, io sono un siciliano, eh, tutti voi ricorderete bene gli attentati del 92 innanzitutto nella mia terra di Sicilia e, eppure nella mia provincia una provincia la più ricca eh, che c'è in Sicilia è la, quella che ha una percentuale di sportelli bancari eh, più importante per numero di popolazione e superiore addirittura alla capitale economica del nostro paese che è Milano io iniziai a parlare di soldi, iniziai a parlare dei traffici delle mafie, iniziai a parlare delle cosiddette agromafie. Voi pensate, le agromafie cosa sono? Sono quelle organizzazioni di criminali di stampo mafioso che si sono messe insieme, tutte le organizzazioni di criminali di stampo mafioso che si sono messe insieme per far arrivare la frutta e la verdura sulle tavole di ognuno di noi. Attenzione, non soltanto in Italia, ma anche all'estero. Spesso i nostri prodotti, i prodotti della mia terra, il pomodoro, il ciliegino, piuttosto che le melanzane, arrivano dalla mia terra. È un business che è un'associazione indipendente, molto qualificata in Italia, ha stimato nel 2023 in 25 miliardi di euro. Voi pensate che ieri la Presidente del Consiglio, Giorgia Meloni, ha presentato la legge di bilancio e che non arriverà a 24 miliardi. Quindi considerate come il business delle agromafie arrivi a superare quello che è il, una legge di bilancio annuale del nostro Paese. Io ho iniziato a scrivere, ho iniziato a denunciare tutto questo e le prime minacce eh, eh, non pensavo veramente, devo fare uno sforzo per, per ritornare a quegli anni, le prime minacce io non pensavo neanche che fossero riconducibili alla criminalità organizzata. Ricordo bene quando nel 2013, esattamente dieci anni fa, più di dieci anni fa, perché era marzo 2013, per la prima volta io trovai eh, sulla fiancata della mia macchina, lato passeggero, la scritta stai attento, era a carattere digitale. Eppure pensai che fosse assolutamente un qualcosa di eh, uno scherzo, un pessimo gusto ma, ma uno scherzo eh, quando iniziai a ricevere tutta una serie di altre attenzioni la lettera con i proiettile poi delle scritte sotto casa che inneggiavano eh, alla mia morte sostanzialmente Il, vado veramente veloce per rispondere alla tua domanda e la mia vita cambia da drasticamente il eh, 16 aprile del 2014 non avevo nessuna protezione ed ero in Firenze e quando eh, venni brutalmente aggredito eh, nella mia campagna che era andato a dare a mangiare al, 
il mio cane, il pastore tedesco, e viene brutalmente aggredito da due uomini che mi lasciarono in terra, mi sono morto in mezzo libro con una spalla frantumata di tre parti. Da allora vivo con la rinnovazione alla spalla, ma soprattutto con limiti morali drammatici. E non era peggio la violenza fisica, ma era peggio la violenza psicologica. Hai perfettamente ragione. Quella campagna dell'ingratoria che già era iniziata all'epoca. Io conservo nel mio telefonino uno screenshot di un messaggio pubblico di una mia collega che quindi mi sarebbe dovuta stare accanto che invece in quel periodo scrisse pubblicamente Borrometti vuole fare la fine di Peppino Impastato. Per chi non lo sapesse, Peppino Impastato è uno dei nove giornalisti uccisi dalla mafia del nostro paese. Eppure non bastò. Lo Stato non eh, arrivò ad una tutela e, e eh, pochi mesi dopo, la notte eh, fra il 23 e il 24 agosto del 2014, diedero fuoco alla porta della mia abitazione. Pensate al settimo piano di un palazzo di nove piani. E io ero in, 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 in convalescenza, avevo la spalla immobilizzata, ero in quella condizione che potete immaginare, ma che non voglio provocare pietà, quindi evito di sottolineare, e fecero anche questo. Dal 25 agosto del 2014, quindi sono nel decimo anno, vivo sotto scorta. Eh, ma come avete visto me ne avevano fatte tante prima di arrivare a questo punto drammaticamente ancora oggi neanche io giustizia per quello che è accaduto eh, per la mia aggressione per il tentativo di abbiamo soltanto dei mozziconi di sigarette con un DNA repertato eh, e ci fa sperare che un giorno possano essere rintracciati, eppure io ho continuato a denunciare, ho continuato a raccontare, ho continuato a fare i nomi e i cognomi delle società ehm, eh, che gestivano quegli affari degli agromafi, ho cominciato a raccontare come in quei comuni spesso la politica era drammaticamente corrotta e collusa con la mafia. Da allora sono stati sciolti tre comuni che hanno interessato, su cui io mi ero interessato, sciolti per mafia, sciogliere un comune significa eh, sostituire il sindaco, eh, le autorità democraticamente elette per 18-24 mesi, mettere dei commissari decisi dal governo. Eppure ancora non bastava, eh, feci un'inchiesta su... Uh, sul pomodoro di Pachino non so chi di voi lo conosce è il vero e proprio oro rosso ed è quello in cui le quattro mafie si, eh, italiane Cosa Nostra, Stida Camorra, Andrangheta Tassaga, Roma, Unita eh, si sono messe insieme io ho tentato di spiegare come queste mafie eh, avevano trovato l'utile nel mettersi insieme e fare affari per arrivare a quei 25 miliardi di euro a cui prima si faceva riferimento. Eppure nel 2018 eh, la, la polizia di Siracusa e il, 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 il giudice per le indagini criminali scrisse, eh, arrestò dei boss di, di, di Siracusa e disse che era stato... Eh, programmata una uh, uh, eclatante azione omicidiaria per eliminare lo sfondo del giornalista. Devo saltare con una sostanzialmente, lo scrive sempre la, la giudice, eh, con un'autocompa nel quale saltare in aria io e gli uomini della mia scorta, che ringrazio e che ringrazio anche oggi perché sono come sempre accanto. E allora, eh, da allora, eh, sono state tante le minacce, sono state tante le denigrazioni, addirittura eh, 
la, la, i giudici di Siracusa hanno scoperto appena qualche mese fa eh, un piano organizzato da un deputato eh, siciliano, un rappresentante eh, alla regione, eh, che aveva pagato eh, alcuni giornalisti, i nostri colleghi, eh, per eh, delegittimare, denigrare me e la mia famiglia. Eh, io racconto sempre che mio padre non c'è più, eh, le gravissime affermazioni che sono state riferite nei miei confronti, ma soprattutto nei loro confronti. Quella campagna di migratoria alla quale tu Emilia facevi perfettamente riferimento. E hanno cercato di uccidere fisicamente e poi psicologicamente. Eh, ho avuto accanto parti di questo Stato, ho avuto accanto eh, la Federazione Nazionale della Stampa quando c'era Beppe Giulietti e oggi per questo ringrazio particolarmente Vittorio Di Trapani. Passando dalla mia esperienza personale, dalle minacce che ho subito a quello che accade in questo Paese, sono troppi. I giornalisti ancora oggi costretti a vivere sotto scorta. È, è difficile fare il proprio dovere in questo modo. Voi pensate cosa voglia dire? Voi pensate quali possono essere le fonti di un giornalista quando si parla di criminalità organizzata? Infatti, spesso possono anche essere all'interno della stessa criminalità organizzata. Come fai a uh, uh, parlare con una fonte? quando hai, come nel mio caso, quattro carabinieri che ti devono proteggere la vita e allora eh, ti vengono incontro le nuove tecnologie, ma è certamente molto complicato. Eppure oggi noi sappiamo, e lo dice un capo mafia di Palermo, che se io non fossi stato sotto scorta mi avrebbero già ucciso, sono altre intercettazioni testuali, mi avrebbero già ucciso da tempo e che... E quando io perderò la scorta certamente mi uccideranno, queste sono le parole testuali. E allora bisogna far fronte all'esigenza di proteggere la vita con però l'esigenza più importante che è quella di informare, che è quella di fare semplicemente il proprio dovere, perché io dai due colleghi che mi hanno preceduto ho con grande orgoglio ho sottolineato la voglia di fare semplicemente il proprio dovere, di raccontare i nostri paesi, di raccontare ciò che non va. Anche a me, collega, hanno detto che io denigravo il mio paese, io denigravo le mie, la mia comunità, la mia città, i miei concittadini. È stato terrificante perché mentre ti volevano ammazzare, e in più ti dicevano che stavi gettando fango, che stavi denigrando la tua collettività per la quale scrivevi è una follia, è un non senso. Eppure, eh, chiudo, eh, vorrei sottolineare come comunque gli apparati di sicurezza, e questo è un qualcosa eh, che mi fa guardare il bicchiere mezzo pieno nel nostro paese, abbiano funzionato perché. Io, grazie alla scorta, sono certamente tra di voi e, della sto, e sto raccontando la mia storia, se non anche se eh, con molta sofferenza. Eh, noi abbiamo un osservatorio al quale proprio partecipa il presidente della Federazione Nazionale della Stampa, Vittorio, eh, che si unisce nel Ministero degli Interni, che fa una mappatura delle minacce ai giornalisti. E questo è fondamentale. E noi vediamo oggi che questo fenomeno purtroppo è ancora eh, molto eh, forte. E, e quindi noi non dobbiamo assolutamente abbassare l'attenzione, sono importanti eh, momenti come questo, ma io penso però che ci voglia un'azione che sia molto più sinergica, al di là dei nostri stati di appartenenza. Questo è fondamentale, perché bisogna proteggere le giornaliste e i giornalisti e semplicemente fargli fare il eh, proprio dovere. Io vorrei concludere, ancora una volta ringraziando chi mi ha preceduto, eh, con... Eh, 
non negando la sofferenza per tutto quello che vi ho raccontato, ma tornando a Daphne Carana Galizia. Daphne Carana Galizia nel eh, 2012 riprese una mia inchiesta giornalistica che avevo fatto eh, fra la Sicilia e Malta, dove dimostravo che anche le armi arrivavano dalla Sicilia a Malta e pensare che poi quell'esplosivo che abbia ucciso Daphne Carola Galizia arrivava proprio dalle stesse zone che io avevo denunciato e che lei aveva ripreso e, e ricordare eh, uno dei suoi messaggi che mi mandò quando, subito dopo la mia aggressione nel 2014 e lei mi scrisse noi abbiamo il dovere di continuare a fare semplicemente il nostro lavoro il problema è convivere con quelle sofferenze che ci sono quotidianamente e che ti cambiano drammaticamente la vita noi non possiamo accettare che si continui così semplicemente per aver fatto il nostro dovere è vero, noi abbiamo il dovere di informare ma abbiamo anche il dovere di tutelare quelle che sono le nostre vite fisiche e la nostra condizione psicologica. E, e questo è un appello che faccio, visto che c'è Renata, la Federazione Europea, e a ognuno di voi. Dobbiamo anche saperci tutelare, altrimenti chi ci guarderà verrà scoraggiato da fare il giornalista e invece il nostro è il lavoro più bello in assoluto è quello che può realmente cambiare le cose nei nostri paesi io ne sono profondamente convinto thank you very much for your powerful appeal, I would say, and, um, and this act of solidarity as well. Um, yeah. as a follow -up. I want to follow up on, on, on what you just said. Um, it's very difficult um, to, to continue working when you experience that kind of a thing. And um, I heard this case, and I need to mention the name because I'm so grateful to to have a, that kind of person in, in our newsroom. Her name is Yelena Evanovic, and she's been the lead, one of the lead investigative journalists in Northern New York. And um, in 2018, like only several days before the journalist, uh, Oliver Lakic, was wounded in front of her apartment that I'm in. Yelena Evanovic was sitting at, um, in a cafe with, 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 uh, with uh, another person, and uh, that other person was, was killed right in front of her. And we're obviously talking about work about this related to her, her investigation. And that kind of a trauma uh, led to her quitting and uh, leaving Montenegro to the United States. And um, so what was it like five months later, I became editor in chief and the first conversation that I had was with her and I tried to convince her to come back and that I will try to, to and you know, obviously there's limited things that I can do, but I will try to guarantee her personal safety and the safety of her, her family, which is not a small responsibility to, to, to take on. And she decided exactly because of the things that you're accentuating in our speeches, because we only want to do our work. And it's really a beautiful work. It's a beautiful effect. We've done extremely dangerous, but we don't ask for any other things, but just to be allowed to do her work. And she's been doing an amazing work in the last five years that I'm very grateful for. And unfortunately, in the last three, she has been living with 24 7 surveillance because of the work that she did in, after she came back to, uh, to, to Montenegro. So I don't think I performed very well of my promise there to her, but there are also some promises that we 
give our citizens uh, as well. And I think we delivered uh, on those. Oh, sorry. Yeah, one, one very important thing related to this uh, about media solidarity, about what you mentioned, uh, the journalists throw things. Well, we had several cases, especially in, in her case, that they were disclosing, obviously, through intelligence data that they were obtaining, who knows how, they were disclosing her sources publicly through mainstream media, not through mm -hmm. social media and so on. They were disclosing her sources. Uh, Colleague said about you know we are using new technologies to talk to our our sources, but it's also it's not hundred percent safe, and there are ways to get to it. So they've been disclosing her sources, making her a target for arrival, obviously criminal organized group, and that is part because why she under surveillance and political well, police security, not political, unfortunately, right now. Um, I wanted to ask if there are any questions from the audience, and we have five more minutes. If not, um, can we ask you another final question, or shall we move to the roundup? Um, so I wanted to ask you, Emilia, um, you said that well, clearly you've been fighting for justice in many different, like in, in all the cases that you are facing. Um, you said that you start to feel, um, you start to lose hope, or you have a lot of hope. At the same time, we discussed another time that there are elections on all different levels in Romania. And to what extent do you see a link between the political wind, so to say, and do you see any opportunities there? It's a, such a good question, Pusha, because next year we will have in Romania four rounds of election, basically all kind of election can, a, a, a European can, country can have local elections, uh, European, uh, for, for the member of uh, European Parliament elections, general elections and presidential elections. So there are four different rounds, it's not all of them in one round. So. Uh, for separating, and my uh, my guess is that uh, the justice is giving now a, a huge uh, hand of help to our politicians, and especially to the prime, former prime minister, because the prime minister at the moment now is the former prime minister. He is uh, the co-leader of the governmental coalition, and we. They, the Liberal Party and National Liberal Party and the Social Democratic Party had a, 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 a commitment to change the uh, prime minister after one year and a half. And now we have the prime minister for the Social Democratic Party. But the former prime minister probably will run uh, next year for the presidential elections from, from his uh, party. And I, I, my guess is that um, considering how much uh, our judiciary system is controlled by uh, politicians, my guess is that uh, uh, the judiciary system is basically giving a hand of help to, um, uh, to, to the Liberal Party and to the Prime Minister. To run without, I don't know, uh, a sensitive case ongoing, as my case, because because uh, even he tried and managed how somehow with the help, of course, with uh, uh, the other members of uh, parliament and uh, uh, for the minister of uh, of education, to manage somehow not to punish anyone for for plagiarism, and now basically it's almost impossible. To withdraw a doctoral is a, a doctoral title for someone to, to plagiarize, if you can imagine, and this happened in the last two years. And basically, even uh, the prime minister is not risking now to with uh, someone uh, an institution of uh, I don't know an academic institution to withdraw his doctoral titles, but 
it will be a huge uh, image problem. The case, uh, my case, basically, and because uh, because last week, as I told you, one of the cases was the clerks because there is any public interest in um, going forward with the investigation. And uh, also because uh, because I, I had a, an audience last week with the uh, Deputy General Prosecutor of Romania. As I told you in the last uh, weeks, there were so many outrageous things that happened related with my cases. I asked for, uh, 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 for, for an audience. Uh, these outrageous things, including the fact that after one year and a half, the pictures are still online. Some of them are still online. And um, at the end of the audience, as I told you earlier, the uh, uh, deputy uh, general prosecutor of Romania gave me uh, 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 an address, and in that address was written that by the end of this month, uh, they will have a solution in the case. The only solution they can have in the case is to close the case without. Uh, going forward with the investigation because basically the, they didn't make any um, uh, relevant, uh, um, uh, I don't know, um, relevant investigation and a relevant uh, procedure in order to put someone in, uh, uh, to put someone uh, under accusation and to have a suspect. So my guess is that they are just uh, trying to close now the case to have. Uh, quiet uh, elections and uh, to, to remove, uh, uh, I don't know, a headache, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, that is a worrying and No, it's, it's outrageous what is happening. And this is just because uh, the politicians are so much involved in uh, controlling the uh, judiciary system. And because the judiciary system is basically un and independent, it's not independent. And uh, just because, uh, because uh, 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 you know, it's so, <laughs> there are so many things. Uh, one of the cases now is uh, on the Supreme Court and the judge is the wife of uh, the head of the control body of the prime minister. So, and <laughs> yeah. So there are so many clues that are showing that everything is controlled to uh, have, uh, 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 I don't know, a certain uh, uh, finish of this, uh, or yeah. a certain end of this of this case. Um, but I, I also want to 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 say to thank Paolo for for what uh, what he's doing. Uh, it was very impressive your your story, your personal story. And I, uh, I, I, I start in the last uh, months to to speak about moral assassination. You know, it's uh, and as you told you, it's it's not just about trying to eliminate a journalist physically, but uh, when they can do it, they are just trying to moral assassinate you. Mm -hmm. um, well. There are so many things to say. So, uh, another senior campaign against me was uh, was uh, 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 on, on on a TV station, uh, TV news station. They said uh, uh, one week after I wrote about the prime minister, so in in uh, January last year, that I was. Um, uh, I was a Russian spy. It was uh, just a couple of weeks before the Russian invasion in, in Ukraine, and it was very fashionable to, to say about someone that was a Russian spy. But uh, myself as a Russian spy, uh, my my pretended partner in life was the uh, was the of course they said that was the. Um, owner of uh, the online platform where I'm publishing uh, since 2016 my articles, but he is uh, an American citizen living in the United States. You know, so they did, uh, and they said that I'm receiving money in a company. I've never had a company. No one in my family had a company. So they are not just trying to find some some um, some information some. At least, I don't know, it's some 
piece of some some very small evidence or some some very small to be a bit credible. No, they are just inventing stories to to moral assassinate you. And uh, I sued this television and I won in the, the first uh, phase, the first phase of the trial. And uh, uh, I made an appeal because the amount of, of, of you said that uh, uh, you said earlier, uh, Elena, that it's very cheap to uh, to have a slap against a journalist. Well, it's also very cheap to uh, moral assassinate the journalist. It was uh, the the court. Uh, so I won, but the court gave me as more compensation, just, just, just 2,000 uh, euros. Uh, they can buy with 2,000 euros 30 seconds of advertising on their television. So with, th with the money that they are receiving for, for 30 seconds of advertising, they can smash your reputation, your your profession, your life, and they can't expose you. So they didn't uh, did it just once. They they republished uh, that article three times, and I made an appeal to this case. And after I made an appeal, they also made an appeal because they 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 said that it's very affordable to pay two thousand euros to uh, 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 to to smash the reputation of someone. Yeah. So. Uh, but when they said, saw that that I, I made an appeal uh, because it's not, they they need to, I don't know, I, I don't want to be uh, rich or wealthy you know, after a, a trial like this, but it's not normal to 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 receive this such a little money for such a, 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 a kind of, of accusation uh, that is. Uh, uh, not sustained by by any evidence or any um uh, anything and uh yeah so it's very complicated to to have this kind of fight mm -hmm. and um if i yeah i think that's that's a very valid point yes and, and uh, something uh, i i want uh, to end uh by by uh sending a, a big thanks to all the journalists that are doing uh, their job with respect for their audience and for respect for for the truth and for respect for for uh, uh, serving democracy and the problem. And uh, I will finish here. I think actually I don't want to add much more. I think these are very good final words, and I would like to give the final words to the journalists. So thank you very much. Thank you all for joining and for sharing your personal stories and for continuing your work and for being so great. Thank you. I will now invite Lorenz Muti from the European Center for Media and Freedom of the Media for the concluding remarks and also give that Thank you. Well, for the time of the follow. Um, and in many ways, actually, I agree with you, Shil, and, um, and, you know, like there, there's no one better to tell, tell the story than the journalists themselves. But unfortunately, we will also sit through my good reflex before we can go ahead and meet people. Um, I'm Lange Sinton, and we're senior advocacy officer at the European Center for Press and Media Freedom. Um, 
we have freedom and pluralism are essential to our democracies, and like democracy itself, they too cannot be taken for granted and must be actively defended and nurtured. The interventions we heard throughout the panels today uh, put the spotlight on the many challenges that journalists face from abusive law surveillance over smear campaigns, harassment, physical violence. Meanwhile, in a significant number of European countries, media are increasingly captured and negatively impacting on pluralism and editorial independence. Um, cheap for them, um, cheap for them, as Yelena said, to, to launch a slot as a media added to, to morally assassinate the character, assassinate someone, and expensive for us, right? Expensive in terms of the price that needs to be paid by news outlets in terms of legal costs when it's about slops, time spent in court, human resources and time wasted. Right. Um, expensive in terms of the, the, the emotional damage that it does. I think we've heard throughout the panels today how, how tough this, this can be really on, on people in the profession. And expensive for all of us, right? Because when a journalist such as the media can only write six stories a year, um, all of our access to information suffers. So, you know, indeed, too cheap for them and too expensive for us, much too expensive for us. Um, the, the stories we heard um, are some, perhaps some of the, the more egregious instances of attacks on journalists and other violations of media freedom. Uh, but unfortunately, they're not exactly in outliers either, and neither are um, these trends limited to Italy and Southeast Europe. Um, with the Media Freedom Round response last year, we documented more than 800 alerts on our uh, monitoring platform, mappingmediafreedom.org. Um, again, not an outlier number, the number is consistent with across the years, um, and, and, and it's really indicative of the many forms of pressure and attacks that uh, journalists and news outlets face each and every day across all of the European Union's member states and Canada countries. Holding power to account and informing Europe's citizens and enabling them to participate in the democratic process comes with an unacceptable price tag that goes far beyond the normal cost of doing business. And in response, you need multiple and sustained efforts by a multitude of actors. Um, as you already mentioned, Louise, and in the introduction, one of the central actors is, of course, to the right. Um, so at this point, I want to take a brief moment to reflect on the role of the media freedom response, um, which we've been playing since the start of the project in 2020. Um, it's a project that's largely funded by the European Commission and is designed to deliver on uh, three key fronts. We monitor and document violations so that policy interventions can be evidence based. Um, two, we provide a range of practical and legal support um, to journalists and news outlets. And three, we engage in advocacy um, with a view to shaping progressive laws and policy at the European and international levels. Um, I'm proud to be part of this project, and, and in many ways, it's, it's a success, right? Um, we, we are raising awareness, um, making it clear that, yes, Europe remains relatively a safe haven, but that doesn't mean that all is good and well when it comes to press freedom uh, on the continent. Uh, we're helping journalists who are under attack to really concrete and much needed assistance. And we're putting forward constructive solutions for the future that implement the public debate while keeping lawmakers and executives on their toes. Um, also, from a project management point of view, it's a successful project. Um, every year we work together more intensely and we work with more and more uh, and in ever closer collaboration with other civil society stakeholders and journalists on the ground. So, we are making a difference. Um, this positive assessment is found even when personally I, I struggle to speak of success in a context where, you know, in reality, it's a never ending game of whack and ball. Uh, you deal with one issue and another one pops up, or sometimes two or three for, for every you know, success story, for, for lack of a better word. So, in that sense, I, I share some of the pessimism and all of ambassadors and there's worry about the continuing backsliding of the burden and values that we also share that at the outset. 
now gloomy parenthesis aside, um, today's conference was also a really timely opportunity to discuss uh, two key avenues for legislative and policy action at the EU level that do provide reasons for optimism, even if it has to be careful optimism. Um, I'm not going to try to summarize the entirety of a, a whole day of discussion and interventions um, because I won't be able to do their complexity justice. But one thing is clear, we need a strong anti-slap directive and a strong European Media Freedom Act as components of a much broader uh, need for progress to create an enabling environment for independent pluralistic media. Opportunities abound then in a way, but we're rapidly speeding towards European elections next year, and so time is absolutely of the essence, as the Canada was uh, stressed in her intervention. Um, Meanwhile, much remains to be done also when it comes to implementation, um, and especially, of course, uh, implementation at the national level. Um, building on, among other things, uh, the work um, on, on the subject within the Council of Europe uh, comes to mind first and foremost. The European Commission's recommendation on the safety of journalists indicates a clear path forward. Uh, it indicates many responsibilities. Uh, of law enforcement and other state actors to make sure that reporters are better protected against physical and verbal violence. Um, looking back on two years of implementation of the Commission's recommendation and almost eight years of implementation, or lack thereof, in the case of the Council of Europe, similar recommendation to its member states. Um, there are definitely some pockets of progress. Uh, some states have established coordination mechanisms between law enforcement and journalist representatives. Um, we had the opportunity here in Italy to meet with uh, the, the coordination center when we have an our mission uh, now two years ago. Um, with, uh, together with, with uh, Fuchsia, um, we did the mission in the Netherlands where TechSide is also an example of, of good practice. Um, of, of building up the capacity um, um, of the police, of prosecutorial services, in collaboration with journalists' representatives uh, to, to respond to attacks on journalists. But in, even in the best case scenario, um, states' efforts for putting these recommendations into practice have been patchy. And that's, of course, not to mention the absolutely disgusting experience with law enforcement that the media spoke of, and which, again, it's an egregious example, but in no way. Um, so let me wrap up these remarks, maybe, with the, with the call to action. First and foremost, uh, on lawmakers and executives at the European and national levels to not only design and enact robust legislative and policy measures, but also to step it up when it comes to effectively implementing them. Um, and a key factor here really is just having the political will and the courage to do so. Um, secondly, also a call to action for all of us in civil society and uh, in the journalistic profession to keep holding our democratic leaders to account and to keep providing the kind of high quality contributions to the public debate that we also saw today. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, my role here is to replace Chiara Frigele um, and read out her speech because, unfortunately, health reasons prevented her from being here. Uh, Chiara Frigele, Director of the Center for International Cooperation in Trento, and therefore I read it out. Um, I'd like to say um, that to me, today's event is in itself a result of the Europeanization of the discussion and action around the role of the situation in media freedom pluralism in our society. It also gives testimony of a long path that we have undergone so far, something that should not be taken for granted, I believe. A decade has passed since the European Commission undertook its first concrete steps um, to give proper consideration to the many concerns about media freedom pluralism um, voice from citizens, NGOs, and the European Parliament. For the first time in 2013, uh, the need to expand new action for strengthening pluralism and freedom of the media in Europe to protect European democracy itself was clearly pointed out in the independent report of the EU High Level Group on Media Freedom and Pluralism. The Media Pluralism Monitor started. 
and data countering uh, the arguments that EU member states have no serious problems with media freedom and pluralism. Then DigiConnect started supporting NGOs and civil society platform in their work to raise awareness, both on an, uh, on an institutional scale and publicly. Since then, we have consistently strengthened our capacity to bring together and mobilize various allies to keep and push the matters of our concern out on the European agenda. Being aware that the challenges ahead of us derive from an unprecedented context of democratic backsliding, uh, we know that we are in a David versus Goliath Ogolian situation. And still, I believe that our discussion has highlighted the main ingredients for our ways out uh, or forward too. Along with some of the practical tools that have been mentioned today, such as trial monitoring, better use of the rule of law, audition to um, monitor question, put pressure on member states regarding the domestic situation of um, media pluralism and media, education of the judges and of the public, I think the most important and effective strategy remains to keep up and boost our efforts to unite forces broaden awareness, empower mobilization at domestic level by strengthening cross-sectoral alliances and nourish our transnational solidarity ties. Please allow me, allow me a final word also to warmly thanks those who made this event possible. Heinrich Wölschiff in Francia, Italia program, which enthusiastically accepted to co-found and co-organize this event that we at OBCD envision within our work program for the media freedom rapid response mechanism. How our gentle host, Eisen, who made accessible to us this beautiful venue and helped in promoting the conference among the foreign correspondents based in Italy. The two main journalistic organizations in Italy, Federazione Nazionale Stampa Italiana and Consiglio Nazionale dell'Ordine dei Giornalisti, which made possible the Italian translation of the conference and our key stakeholder of our daily work in Italy. Our MFRR um, partners, um, Article 19, ACPMF, EFJ, FPU, IPI. It is a source of pride, pleasure and encouragement to undergo this journey together, relying on the opportunity to share our different expertise, our common determination, our stubbornness in continuous searching ways to resist democratic backsliding, to counter threat to journalists and journalists, and to empower more actors in fight for our rights to be informed, to voice critic, to dissent, and ask un uncomfortable questions. Finally, let me voice a special thank to my colleagues that for months have worked to organize this event. First and foremost, Serena Epis, conference coordinator, Zilke Terner, Dimitri Bettoni, Nicole Corridore, Paolo Martini, and uh, please give them and um, uh, to the audience a big round of applause for the success of the conference and an encouragement for the work that we will continue doing in the future. Thank you.